wherever you get that. You get Fred Zimmerman's Boeing book and Orrin O'Brien's notebook. You've got the whole package. It was great having today's guest on for a second time a couple years later for a follow-up episode. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contrabass Conversations, and we're talking today with Stephanie Patterson, who specializes these days in teaching adult learners. She's had quite a journey, and you can check that out on the first episode, which was, I believe, from 2019. I think we were trying to figure that out during the episode. So a lot has happened <laughs> since 2019. So we talk about what the pandemic has been like for her and her teaching of adult beginners, teaching adult beginners or adult amateurs, or there are many terms for, for folks in that boat. And I'm an adult amateur in many ways in my life. If you're an adult, you probably are too in other things that you do. So lessons learned, many, many other takeaways. Stephanie is awesome. Really, really fun chatting with her. Quick shout out to our sponsors, the Carnegie Mellon University Double Bass Studio, Ear Trumpet Labs, and Upton Bass String Instrument Company. More on all of them later in this episode. And let's dig into it with Stephanie Patterson. You know, if you could pick somewhere to be locked up for a pandemic, San, you could do worse than San Francisco is sort of my my thought. But um, it's been nice to get out of the get out of my I mean, I barely left the city for 18 months. And so it's been nice to actually do some traveling. Uh, what's traveling? Uh, yeah. I <laughs> saw so you. Have, have you been staying staying close to home? Yeah. You know, when you hit my age. You kind of need to to be a little hyper careful, mm -hmm. and that's pretty much what I've been doing. Uh, you know, grocery delivery, because I'm in an apartment building, and I don't go out of the apartment without a mask. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, let the covidians go around and have their little fun without their masks, but not me. And um, I've been a couple places, but I won't eat out. Because we're, in, for some reason, Pennsylvania, particularly my county, is still what they call high incidence of spread. Mm -hmm. So I've been a little hyper careful. However, I did have my summer orchestra this year. Oh, you did? Okay, great. Yes. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, it, we're called the Abington Festival Strings. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, of course, last year was a no-go. And this year was almost a no-go. Up until April, we were still no-go. Wow. Then the end of May, we get the go-ahead from the retirement community where we're in residence. And this gives us like two months to do about six or seven months of work. So I got my co-music director and, and librarian. We put heads together. I came up with a list of rep. We scheduled the rehearsals. And boom, we were off and running. Wow. Um, I put a vaccine only clause in there. Mm -hmm. I had two players I couldn't have come in. Only two. Only two. That's great. Only two. Yeah. Well, it's a small group. I mean, you know, I have maybe 50 on the roster, but we'll get 25 or so in any given year. And it went really well. We did have to make a couple of last minute switches, for instance. The place we were going to rehearse um, at the last minute said, you can't bring that many players in here. So have people rotate out. You don't tell people to rotate out of an orchestra. We're right. not a baseball team. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so we found a church a little farther out, but you know, in the same vicinity, reached out to their music director. And she said, absolutely, come here, use our fellowship hall. You can control your own air conditioning. You know, we'd love to have you. That's great. And, you know, we have parking lot. I mean, it, they were amazing. I had their key, um, controlled the thermostat, which I've always got to do. And we were then we were going to go back to the retirement facility for a concert at the end of August. And my librarian, who's got a really rock solid head on his shoulders said um you know stuff um maybe we might want to not go there even though we're vaccinated and they're vaccinated um we could be bringing something malevolent malevolent in and i said yeah you're probably right so i reached out to the commute to the music director of this church and i said can we have another couple weeks and she said absolutely it's yours oh that's so great. instead of doing a concert we had a Bach bash. Hmm. And we pulled out a whole bunch of Bach and just had a blast. 
That's great. <laughs> nice. Yeah, so I conducted a little bit this summer, and um, and, and it was a lot of fun. And everybody was in a real upbeat mood and happy to see everybody. And it was the first live music I'd been around in over a year and a half. Wow. Yeah, that's that's got to have been a, a great summer. Yeah, I didn't I didn't do anything. I didn't play live until June this year. I went down to Los Angeles and played and I got off the plane and 45 minutes later, I was rehearsing a bass quartet and it was like, I never left. It was, it was so fun. And then they just Saturday, I was playing a concert. And so it's been nice to get out and we're all masked up. You know, like, I don't think I've they, they, not worn a mask to perform the, at least certainly the, basically since, since getting back out there, but it's been, it's been nice to get out and, and play again and, and, and um, I'm sort of remembering what I don't like about travel, which is sitting in the airports and all that. And, you know, the pandemic travel is, is you know, yet a level more annoying than non-pandemic travel. So I think I'm, I'm looking forward. I've, I've, it's been great to kind of scratch that itch after such a long period of time and get out and play and see some people. But it'll be nice. I'm kind of looking forward to being at home for a good chunk of time uh, after, yeah. after Thursday. I'll be back Thursday. After, after Thursday. <laughs> Any, any who know, I've, I've been listening to the podcasts and just really, they've been so helpful this year. Oh, that's great. Wow. Yeah. And, and, and I've noticed you've been leaning more toward pedagogical subjects. And I said, wow, this is, this is really right up my street right now because I'm a total teaching nerd. Right. I was trying to remember, when did we talk for the podcast? I lose all sense of time with like, uh, it was a cut. Was it a couple of years ago? Maybe 2018, 2019. Okay. Something like that. At yeah. least. Yeah, yeah. At least it's been, it had to be 2018 or yeah, right in that area. Okay. Okay. Hmm. Cause that's, it's been, a, it's been a while. Right. All it's I remember is where I was when I was talking to you and I know it wasn't in this place. It was in my old place. So it had to have been somewhere between 2017 and 2020. <laughs> and we were on the phone because yeah. the technology wasn't quite there yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now look what we've got. Right. All of a sudden, everybody's much more comfortable with video conferencing. It actually became very easy for me to figure out how to connect with people remotely for the podcast because all of a sudden, everybody knew what Zoom was. It used to be like Skype. Like, I think I called you on the phone, but I had to call you probably over Skype so that I could record it because it's hard to record a regular phone call. So the, ever since March 2020, it's been very easy to everybody seems to know what Zoom is. Zoom and Skype. I go to the ISB Saturdays, mm -hmm. of course, at Zoom. Um, yeah, that's that's a good way of kind of segueing into what we're going to talk about. We're doing the technology mm -hmm. and how things have changed so drastically in 18 months in terms of playing and connecting with people and even just for the kids going to school. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, yeah, I'm guessing you've been doing a lot of on. You continued your teaching, I'm assuming, but just yes. doing it remotely. Yeah. Thank goodness for my loyal students. Oh my God, <laughs> I love them. Um, I'm using Skype, and one of my students isn't comfortable using the video stuff. He's taking his lessons by telephone. Wow, interesting. Now, <laughs> okay. This is an interesting challenge for the poor teacher, right? Fortunately, he's been with me a few years and I know what his hand position looks like. I know where his problems might lie and it's made me use my ears much more keenly. So for instance, I can say, um, your right shoulder's up again. How do you know? I said, I heard it. <laughs> <laughs> or uh, put your bow down, please. Shake out the tension from your hand because you're grabbing the bow and you're sweating. How do you know? I said, I hear it. Mm -hmm. How do you know? The crunch on the string. Uh, well, that really should be a down bow and I heard you do up bow. How did you know that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the things that your ears learn to do to adapt, it's amazing. So I did have a chance to check him out. He plays in his synagogue group. 
and they were live streaming a musical service, all music. I said, oh, goody. <laughs> and he sent me the link. And I sat here and I heard some absolutely beautiful music, so beautifully played. And I kept watching his left hand. <laughs> and he was fine. He was fine. I was so thrilled. I was so proud of him and grateful that I hadn't steered him wrong by not insisting that we go video. I had asked him a few times to please use Skype. And he just, I knew, wasn't comfortable with it. So I stopped that conversation quickly. I said, fine, we'll just use the phone. After several years of planning, I'm so happy that my course, Beginner's Classical Bass, is out on Discover Double Bass. This course is made up of 66, yes, that's a lot, <laughs> video lessons which cover a wide range of topics on classical double bass, starting from taking your bass out of the case, which is very fun <laughs> to film, and Jeff Chalmers of Discover Double Bass and I have a great blooper reel about that, and leading to different bow strokes, such as staccato and portato. The topics also include posture, simple scales and arpeggios, left-hand technique, bowing technique, simple pieces, which are fun to play, practice tips, and much more. You can learn more through the link in the show notes or just visit discoverdoublebass.com slash Jason Heath. It is impressive how many notable bass players have gone through Carnegie Mellon University. Here is faculty member Micah Howard on some of these figures and what they've gone on to do. There are some names that people might be surprised to know that they, they studied at CMU. For instance, George Vance is a Carnegie Mellon graduate. I don't know if you knew that or not. No, I didn't know that. Yeah, and he studied with Tony Bianco at Carnegie Mellon and uh, Galen McCormick. So two wonderful pedagogues went to CMU. And yeah, there are tons of, of players out there. I don't know all the ones from the past, but I know a few like... There's Thomas Letterer, who's the co-principal in Dallas. He studied at Carnegie Mellon and Joel Reist, a principal in Nashville. Mm -hmm. But in recent years, you know, like Corey Palmer, principal bass in Rochester Philharmonic, CMU graduate, and a bunch of uh, Brandon McLean, who's our acting principal in, in Pittsburgh, is a former CMU student. It's a great place to study bass. I have had such a great time learning about the program and visiting Pittsburgh. You can learn more and sign up for a free trial lesson at micahbhoward.com slash Heath. And thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. This episode is brought to you by Ear Trumpet Labs. They make an incredible mic for upright bass called the Nadine. And six-time Grammy-winning jazz bassist and former Contra Bass Conversations guest, Christian McBride is a big fan. Christian says, as an acoustic bassist, it's very important for me to have this instrument amplified as naturally as possible. What I love about this microphone is that it makes the instrument sound exactly how I hear it in my head. Honestly, I don't know if you can get a better review than that. The Nadine is an instrument-mounted condenser mic with an incredibly clear natural sound and great feedback rejection. Ear Trumpet Labs is offering a free t-shirt with mic purchase from their website. Just visit www.eartrumpetlabs.com slash contrabass to claim yours and learn more about Nadine. It's incredible what you can, that's a, that's a real testament to what you can do with your ears. You're taking me back to when I used to teach it to Paul and sometimes I would just close my eyes and listen to students and it'd be funny how, how, um, how my, the, the auditory sense increases, you know, as you remove those visuals. Cause you get so used to what someone looks like, with it, but then you, when you really listen, sometimes you can, you can diagnose in a different way. Yeah, like I said, I've been with him long enough that I watched every movie made when he was playing. So fine, what do I do? Um, just try to remember what he was doing when I heard a particular sound. Mm -hmm. And I, that's somehow recorded in my memory and kind of goes back to the, the who was um, with Jeff about the, the vibration thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was an ISV thing with Gary Carr and he had a deaf student Yes, Hector Torado. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the duet with the ensemble between them was flawless. And it goes back to that when you when one sense is removed, you develop your other senses. Absolutely. So the phone thing has just blown me away. We you know, I'll hear him start an open D string and I say, mm, you've got to breathe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, so you that's can, and, kind of... and then you can hear that over the phone. You know, it's one thing if it was like, like in person, like I was talking about with the, with the, you know, just closing my eyes, but over the, you know, you remove so much of the frequency spectrum, but you still can hear a lot, can't you? Well, what helps when I'm teaching him, 
uh, I have a pair of Sony headphones, the kind that fit over your ear. Mm -hmm. 20 bucks. I use them. Cheap little headphones. And I can hear so much more than if I just use the speaker. Absolutely. And it kind of puts the sound directly in your ear. That's what's helping. And it's, you know, and they're comfortable. It's not a big deal. They just fit right over top and nothing is on my head and the earbuds aren't bugging me. And, you know, with glasses, you have to really be careful what you've got over here. Or it's going to really hurt. Anyway, so that that's one of the huge changes is that I've learned how to teach virtually and I've learned how to teach without even seeing. Mm -hmm. That to me is nothing short of a miracle that, that it can be done. It's interesting because I, I was thinking it was going to be, I have a couple of adult students that I, I, I don't teach a lot, but I have a couple of high school students and I have a couple of adult students. Uh, and, and I thought, oh, well, this will be a breeze with the adult students, but this will be a challenge with the high school students. And that's not exactly been the case for me. It's, it's one of the high school students. It's been super easy. One of them, it was more challenging. And with the adult students too, like, like I can tell some people this, this sort of uh, Skype or Zoom interaction works fine. And then, and then another they just are so used to like seeing those those it's been a little more of a challenge like communicating through the camera so it's been it's been interesting with my limited experience in that well i do a lot of air base mm -hmm. where i'll hold the bow and i'll say okay you know and i do all kinds of different hand angles um and they get it they totally get it um so anyhow over the last 18 months I've got all these notes that I made because I'll forget stuff. You know, sure. we'll get to talking and we'll go, go off on a tangent and have fun and just have a chat and it's great. Um, so the past 18 months, I have been an online junkie. Mm -hmm. It's been wonderful that way. I have been able to, well, Ira Gold did a workshop for teachers and it was a virtual workshop. He brought in Carol and Emery from England and Tracy Rowell from Oberlin and the three of them taught, there were 27 of us in a class originally designed for like 21. It was the most wonderful experience in five hours. We had two workshops, one on a Friday, one on a Sunday, two and a half hours each. And the copious notes I took and the networking and the people I got to meet, people I admire who were a part of this, you know, Galen McCormick is one of my heroes of all times, I think. Um, she's right up there with Arn O'Brien. Anyway, what we were able to learn, bowing technique, handling a difficult student situation, sensitive situations, how to present various things. It was a refresher. It was really, it was a refresher for us. At the same time, it was a lot of support because mm -hmm. we're out there doing this on our own. And to bring 27 of us together from different parts of the world, I met Heather Miller Larden, I'm one of her fans for early music. And she was asking me questions, which kind of, oh dear. Um, and I met another teacher from England who was asking me questions about adult students. And we were back and forth and changing ideas and it was absolutely wonderful experience. And then Manhattan School of Music has done all these master classes, which they opened up via Zoom. So I was just, invisible silent fly on the wall um and so i got to hear bass master classes i went to violin master classes i heard their performances and i'm sitting here taking notes like crazy getting more and more and more resources i could use for if and when we finally get back in person and i'm saying if because it seems like forever um so i've gone to to concerts i've been looking for music resources like crazy on inslip and finding books and so, of course, you know, Delivery Man shows up with a stack of books because nerd that I am, I want to know more. Well, this person said that. Well, then why did he say it? Who did he get it from? You know, mm -hmm. um, YouTube. Oh, my God. YouTube has been it for me. You, you can Finding spend, new music. You can spend a lot of time there, can't you? <laughs> oh, and it's free. I mean, what right. do you, you know? Um and I've, I've done a lot of emailing with other players and other teachers. You know, what do you do here? Or I'll get a question. Well, how do you handle this? And what resulted from the original podcast? I started receiving emails from Columbia, 
from other states, people who didn't really have access to a teacher or just had some questions or needed some support. And I got an email from a gentleman in North Carolina who is trying to retire, but his company won't let him go, <laughs> which, I, which speaks highly of him. Right. And he's looking for a base. And he's interested in taking lessons with me over Skype because I teach adults. So we've been corresponding back and forth. He'll have questions or I'll just sit, I'll just check in. Hey, how you doing? What's going on? Is there anything I can help you with? Um, how's retirement treating you? And then he tells you what happened. Oh my God, <laughs> this guy must be amazing. <laughs> so those are some of the things that have been kind of happening in my neighborhood. And some things that I learned with adults that I carry back from learning special education in college. You know, you teach to the student, not at, mm -hmm. or you don't take the, the prescribed technique and say, or the book and say, here's lesson one, lesson two, lesson three, but you really learn how to listen and it happens even more so with Skype. Interesting. Any problems seem to be a little bigger because of all the, the, the garbage going on outside and how everyone's lives have changed. So I teach to the goals and interests and I've learned how to use non-musical examples. Nice. So I have a student who's an architect. I know about as much about architecture as I do about rocket science, which is kind of like, forget it. Um, and I'll start talking about the building that if you're off by a tenth of a millimeter at the start. By the time you get to top it off, it's going to lean at about a 90 degree angle. <laughs> you know, it's cumulative. And yeah, you kind of, you know, you're right. So we go with that. And there's what I do at the beginning of each lesson. I write out a lesson plan, first of all, for each, each student. And at the beginning, instead of the, the proverbial review, what did you work on this week? You know, make sure the whole, it's how you doing? Mm. What's going on? How was your week? What's happening? You know, how's the wife? How's the brother? How, how's it? You know, how are the cats? It kind of takes away that stress. Yeah. So it's, it's added a little more to my arsenal of how do I teach adults? What have I learned? How did I use this last 18 months? Sounds like you've used them well. <laughs> I hope. I, I hope. Um, so now, I've, I know I've taken over the whole no, show. No, please. I, I, I love it. Uh, in my email, I mentioned some difficult subjects. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you want to bring up difficult stuff. Sure. Absolutely. We can go anywhere. Oh, dear. <laughs> well... <clears throat> Sorry for the, the frog in my throat. It's allergy season. They cut the grass outside. I turn on the AC, but not soon enough. Yep, I understand. <laughs> I did get a, a student, an adult, and he reached out to me by email. He had heard the podcast. Now, this is a couple years after, and he must have... So your podcast keeps circulating around. It, it doesn't, it has a good life of its own. That's great to hear. <laughs> oh, I was thrilled. Also, he was recommended to me by someone local. So it was kind of a double whammy. And he reached out to me by email. And I called him and we had a chat. I said, oh, this could really work well. So we started lessons over Skype. And here's a beginner. I had no idea he was a beginner, beginner. That's something I normally would absolutely not do because you need that hands-on approach. You know, the student needs you to take his instrument so he hears his own instrument. And here's how you hold your left hand. Here's how you're holding the bow. This is what you want to do. We didn't have that luxury. First thing I said, I want to teach him how to bow open strings. If you've got a sound, if you can control this right hand, the left hand will fall into place much more easily. So take one hand at a time which is what we did. Well, he was getting a sound within just a few minutes. Mm. And I gave him bowing exercises <clears throat> from Fred Zimmerman's book. 
the open string exercises in Samandal. And I have Rufus Reed's The Evolving Basis. Love that. All these open string bowing exercises. I said, this is how we're going to start. Well, he was having a blast with this. And then we started with, okay, you're ready to really play. And he starts progressing. And I'm thinking, we're doing this without being in the same room. It's amazing. Then I noticed the progression slowed dramatically. This little thing of getting the first finger playing with the tip and not playing with this outside edge. Mm -hmm. And shifting from half to first, just a little slide. I had been doing the glissando exercises and they're so much fun. And they get the arm relaxed and they get the forearm in shape for moving as an entire unit and not just the wrist moving, but the whole arm mm -hmm. supporting that hand and just up and down. And, and he was doing them so beautifully. So, so when you shift, you simply start a glissando, but you're not gonna go more than a couple inches. And listen for that nice little half step and you can slide into it. It's okay to slide into it because ultimately you won't. Okay, well that was always a shift into three quarter position. So it was getting either an E flat augmented or an E diminished right in the crack. But he tried, he was trying. <clears throat> so then he insisted on in-person lessons. I don't teach in my home, it's small. I said, well, there's a social room downstairs. I might be able to get it once or twice a month and it's large. He won't get vaccinated. Oh my God. Got to keep the mask on over your nose. Okay, I'll do that. Fine. So he comes in for an in-person lesson and everything went great. We were like eight feet apart. And I walked around behind him to check the, the what his thumb was doing. And I fixed an issue right there. I said, okay, this is great. I said, now the next lesson will have to be Skype. And he took a Skype lesson. And then he started to decide that he was going to control the lessons. And I started having this pit in my stomach. <laughs> Is this going to work or not? I don't want to be the mean teacher. I don't want to be the, the my way or the highway. I've since learned you've got to learn, you've got to do it that way. Or the caboose will drive the train. Okay, well, so I said, all right, I can do one more Skype, but I have other students who want in-person lessons. I'm only allowed this room twice a month and you've already had it my twice a month. So it means my other students can't have it. So it comes to a lesson and I knew something was way off. I couldn't get him to use the tip of the finger. It was always the side. Okay, but I saw some progress. I com complimented him on his excellent bow work. His bow was straight, his sound was good. It's just, he was flat. Mm. And so I correct a mistake the second I hear it. I'll say flat, flat. There's no movement in the hand, no attempt to adjust. It's not going well, folks. Anyway, I get an email that evening well, people on YouTube play this way. <laughs> that was not a good sentence for me to read. And it's impossible to play the way you're telling me. Oh my God, no, 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 this has gone south. <laughs> this is, this is, oh God, what do I do? I was so, I don't know, I was shocked and I was hurt and I was confused. So I reached out to two of my mentors one of whom has been my friend for 51 years. Wow. Who colleagues, I studied with him. Um, and this is Peter Baylor from Buffalo. We were from, well, he got, he retired to Buffalo with his family. Sure. Um, and I'm using his base as a matter of fact. Oh, nice. So I called Peter, I said, what do I do? I reached out to people through email, what do I do? And I knew what I had to do. So I sent an email 
just explaining that I didn't think this was going to work and that I would be happy to help him find another teacher. That I really did believe he had the potential to get into a community orchestra. And I'm sorry I couldn't help him. You know, I was trying to be as nice as I could. And you can edit any of this out that you choose. Oh, sure. No, but this is great. I think people all, I, 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 I'm thinking back to many students, you know, in that, yeah, I, I think we can probably all relate to this sort of uh, situation. Yeah, well, so I got an email back. No, I didn't get anything else that night. The next morning, my phone rang at eight o'clock. Do not call me at eight o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I'm sorry. And I kind of looked at and I saw the ID and I said, I'll just let it go to voicemail. I'm not alert. I'm not awake. I, I'm not going to deal. Followed by a howler. If you watch Harry Potter, you know what a howler is. Mm -hmm. A howler of an email. And I said, okay, I'm just not going to answer any of it. I just, I'm, no. Let's see, I was snappy. I was mean. Um, he's going to make it into an orchestra on his own. He has no intentions of looking for another teacher. Yeah, well, but, you know, best wishes. <laughs> That's what I said. I just hit on the email, delete, delete, you know, phone, delete, delete, oh, block, and then delete. Uh, so no, I'm 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 out of this. I'm not going to have any confrontation, any argument, any further discussion. Good luck, best wishes, have a good life. I'm out. And it still haunts me. I started, I swear to you, looking on YouTube for people I know who have the best hand technique. I saw nobody playing with this part of the finger. Hey there, my name is Dr. Garrett Hope. I am a composer, coach, podcaster, and speaker. I've been focused on building my music business since 2014 and helping others build theirs since 2015. I want to tell you about the second annual Ultimate Music Business Summit we are organizing. It'll take place early January of 2022. There will be dozens of presentations with highly actionable content, all of it available to you so you can start your business, grow your business, and ultimately make more money. Because here's the deal. Unless you earn all of your income from an employer, you are a self-employed small business owner. And if you want to do more than survive, if you want to grow your audience, or if you want to impact more people, you have to think and act like a business owner. And that means this summit is for you. This summit will give you real world, not theoretical strategies you can implement immediately. You don't need to be stuck with fear or living in your failures. I promise you, with all the teachers lined up, you will get something you've never thought of before. Even though building a business is hard, no one is promising it's easy. It is possible. You just need the right tools and strategies. Tickets for this virtual event will go on sale soon. To be the first in line and to get more information about the summit, presenters, and more, go to musicsummit.biz. That's musicsummit.biz and add your email to the list. This episode is brought to you by Upton Bass, and have you checked out this new travel bass from Upton? Oh my goodness, what a cool looking design, what a great sounding bass, it's just totally remarkable, and the way that they're launching this product, it's just so perfectly Upton, it's uh, bold, it's innovative, you gotta check out these videos of Gary Upton unfolding, I don't even know how you describe it, putting together, I guess, this travel base. It takes almost no time. It is in a Samsonite piece of luggage. I kid you not. It is just the suitcase. It is literally a suitcase base, but it comes together and it's a real base. It's a nice sounding base. So cool. Just another example of the way in which Upton is innovating and blazing new trails for the bass community. So thank you for what you do, Upton, and thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast.
And, and and even if you did, you know, I think it's it's the the the. I, I've always been of the philosophy that when you choose to study with someone and enter into that relationship, just your your the best approach is to just just, uh, you know, follow their follow you know exactly what they're saying. You know, we have a long life; we can choose to go a different direction. But like, you're just I I I've never found that like massively questioning everything or like, and that's part that's why. One one would go to a teacher is to get that curated because there's so much out there. And that's like the, the benefit and drawback of our current, you know, world where we have, you know, more, I, I could watch double base YouTube videos every single minute of the rest of my life and not run out of them. Right. But to have someone curate and show no, go this way, try this way. I mean, that's why, and that's true in double base. It's true in any aspect of life. You know, if I was going to improve my running and I would go to uh, get, get work with a coach and a great coach, I wouldn't all of a sudden start saying, well, I saw on YouTube, this guy runs this way, you know, and there's a random video I saw. So it's a, it's, it's probably good to, it's good, good, good on you to sort of sense that where this was going. Cause I think a lot of us have spent a lot of energy and, and probably just, you know, that, that was probably just going to, that was the beginning of what was just going to probably be a, a weird battle that would just like leech, leech your energy out of you that you are using for your other students. Yeah. It, it was tough, but I, I think that, and something similar to this was discussed in the Boeing workshop, mm. not quite as, as serious, but it was the case of an older student going to a younger teacher, but the younger teacher was way more advanced than this older student. And, and there was a, you know, it was a great discussion among the teachers how to handle this sensitively. And it was brought up so beautifully with so much love and so much gentleness that I took a lot away from that too. Uh, but, you know, I guess if you're teaching, you're going to run across a student who simply doesn't want to do what you're telling them. Now, most adults that I've run into, that's not the case. Mm -hmm. They're, wow, I can get lessons. Oh my God, this is great. And they go into it with such enthusiasm and they stay with it. I, mean, I have one student for almost 13 years, an adult. Mm -hmm. And I am so proud of him. And he and his wife and I are friends. But during that lesson, he knows I'm in charge without my ever having to have said it in the past because he really wants to learn. Uh, and this is kind of pulls me into another area. I've been encouraging this one particular student to start teaching. He lives in a different part of town than I do. And he's got a real sense of community outreach. And he's incredibly gifted and incredibly talented in so many areas. And I said, you really would make a marvelous base teacher. And so I talked to him this week and I said, well, you know, I'm doing this interview with you. We're going to chat. And what would you like me to bring up? Is there any subject that you would like? He said, yeah, mentoring the teacher. Hmm. I, well, that's, that's fascinating. You know, how do I help him become a teacher as well as my student? But mainly, what audience does he want to reach? How do I help him reach it? He wants to work with kids who may or may not have access to instruments or an orchestra program. And he's involved in a couple of other projects in his local community center, which I think are absolutely fantastic. He's a visual artist. He works with movement. He's, I mean, he's just, he's a Renaissance gentleman. <clears throat> and I said, well, you know what? I'll bring this up with Jason, share my ideas. I said, so first of all, do you have an ax to put in their hands? And he's working on that. He's going to reach out to the schools to see who's got unused bases mm -hmm. that these kids could borrow on their lunch hours or at any point to get it in their hands. <clears throat> For lessons, he has an extra base that they could use. I said, well, that's number one. Um, I said, so the other thing is, come to me with your questions. If you have a, a doubt or anything that you're not sure about, or how do you approach something, come to me. If I can't figure it out with you, 
I will go to somebody else. So then if, when you get a couple of students, let's get them playing together as an ensemble. Get them in the same room, get some of these easy ensemble books. Um, Fred Zimmerman put a bunch together there are four volumes, I think, that Lucas Drew edited. And so there's other stuff, too. There are a lot. Galen McCormick is doing this. Mm-hmm. And so there's a lot of these ensemble things that we can pull on just for the beginners. Get them in as a group. And I'll come in and do a master class for you. I'll come in and help you and show you how to manage the group. I'll, I'll, I'll do this. I learned that from Ira Gold at his first Boeing workshop that I attended in person about five years ago now. I've got the tools. I can do this. So anything you need, you make one phone call next to me and we'll work together and make it happen. And so those are the types of things I think that a teacher who's been at this for a while can offer a student, encourage a a particularly good student or someone who's got that bent, encourage that student to teach others. Mm -hmm. And then you know, to target an audience that he would like to work with. And then let's see, well, how can you make it happen? How can you help? So those are the kinds of things that we came up with together. And I don't know if you have other thoughts on this or what your take would be. Sure. Well, and folks listening, uh, feel free to reach out with any any thoughts as well. But yeah, yeah, yeah no, it's a giant <laughs> mystery. I mean, the, the, the more, the, the longer I teach and am involved in music, the less sure I am about what I know or don't know, or the more sort of like mysterious it all is to me. But I mean, what you, what you said, like getting people together early in groups, I think that's so key. And yeah, I remember, I remember talking to Gary Carr. I think he was talking to Gary Carr or maybe read an interview or something, but you know, at a certain point in his life, uh, he was asked to teach electric bass and you know gary carr i i don't think he's like you know slapping and popping the electric bass but I, but he and i don't know if he ever actually ended up doing but he said he said great you know i'll just stay stay ahead I'll, i'm gonna i'm gonna learn it and then i'll uh, i'll come to you with it you know so i think just being being open and receptive to teaching and and i mean you're such a great example of a lifelong learner of so i mean taking all these these master master classes and these zoom events and these workshops and i mean i think that's the, that's just so important getting your students teaching that is such a cool thing when i've had that happen um you know they they're they the my next experiences teaching them just get so enriched but yeah teaching the teacher mentoring the teacher that's an interesting one um it's so complicated because i i i i've I, one of my maybe there's a lesson here somewhere on then I'll stop babbling but what, what I went and started teaching high school orchestra I did that for seven years and one of my main mentors was a wonderful wonderful person named Frank Lestina I took over the school program that he had he had it for 25 30 years and I would watch Frank teach something and and he always said it's not what you teach it's how you teach it and he just had this way of making everything amazing and i'll give you a quick example we were rehearsing the star spangled banner for graduation this is not the most you know generally uh, musically you know momentous moment of your life it's kind of like the last gig and then you go on summer vacation but frank and, and so they come in and they had like a 20 minute rehearsal right just enough time to get it happening but frank he had everybody pull Play, and then he said, and it was an F major chord uh, to start with, or maybe an F set or whatever. But he he's like he's like, hey, wait, listen to this chord. And he was just he he was just tuning the chord, but he did in this way. It was like, hey, look at this. Hey, isn't this interesting? How and and that reminds me in a way of something Barry Green said to me about teaching too. He was doing a master class that I was at down in Mexico, and 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 went through the master class, and then and then Barry just said, you know, I've never really taught anything in my life. I just point things out you know all i do is i point things out to people and i thought like whoa that's kind of a deep lesson there from barry so i don't know if there's any value in any of that but that's my that's there my, is okay <laughs> no because barry's well, well we're going to mention another one of my idols i've read barry's books i've stolen techniques out of them mm-hmm. they're so helpful the, the one lesson he gave and i forgot if it was his first or second book who's working with a cellist who said, I just can't make that big shift. I just can't make it. And he said, well, show me, make the mistake. Let me see what you're, you're doing. Make the, go ahead and make the mistake. 
she could not make that mistake. She hit that note every time right on the head. As oh, okay. Give the student permission to make the mistake. It takes the stress off. Mm -hmm. The student doesn't think, oh my God, I've got to make this shift. The student's thinking, I'm just going to do what I normally do. Mm -hmm. You know, just, just do it and forget about the rest of it. I, I was blown away and it works. I've seen it work. Isn't that interesting? I'll say, I'll say to my <laughs> student, well, let me see what's happening. Show me the mistake. Let's see what's going on. Inevitably, the mistake goes away. Well, geez, I've been making it all week. I said, um, no, you're not. Not anymore. <laughs> you're not going to make that mistake again. You, you've, got, you've got this. Get out of your way. You're in your own way. Yeah. yeah. Stop thinking and do it. You know, um, so yeah. Oh, electric bass. Can we go up on a funny tangent? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. This, this is true. <laughs> Back in the 70s, when I was in the Richmond Symphony, I got hired during the summer to do a lot of dinner theater. And this one particular dinner theater was doing Man of La Mancha, which is probably still my favorite musical to play. So I'm back there in the pit, or actually behind the stage, behind the scrim. And we were having a ball. I mean, the music director was wonderful. I had a couple of Richmond Symphony colleagues with me. And the people I didn't know, we were just, we just all became this great gang. And we're having a blast and we're hanging out with the actors and, and the, the, the theater director. And everybody's just one big, big group. And I said, you know, we're rehearsing this new show called Diamond Studs. And it's a folk, rock, folk, blues, something or something opera about the life of Jesse James, making this criminal into some kind of folk hero. And the musicians have to be on stage because they're going to play. They, are, they actually have roles to play. And we can't get a bass player who can read music and sing at the same time. They can either sing and not read music or read music and not sing. I thought it's a problem. Well, well, you know, you have a free night this week. Would you mind coming to rehearsal and filling in? And your bass is already out here because I had a gig bass I could leave there. Would you just play bass so we can hear what it sounds like? Sure. So they put the music in front of me and I went, oh my God, it's chords. Oh no, I know what they are, but I can't give them a good bass line like this. I don't, this is not my thing. So I'm playing chords and finding a few notes in between and everybody's saying, wow, this is really cool. It sounds so good with the bass. Oh, wow. Um, could you come again like tomorrow night? <laughs> yeah because I'm meeting these really cool people and they were known actors in the Richmond area. They were known for doing local theater. As, and there was even a, a TV personality in the bunch. I'm, yeah. So I went the next night and they said, Steph, could you sing the alto part on this song? I'm not an alto, I'm a soprano. Anyway, why not? So, I, so I'm looking at the, the music and I'm playing and I'm looking at two things at once and Someone's standing next to me holding music, someone's turning pages, and I'm surrounded, you know, just going away. So this is really fun. Um, oh, Steph, would you read that line there for us, please? Yeah, sure. Yeah. I'm having a blast. Steph, can we see you? Do the break. Can we talk to you a minute? Oh, what am I doing? <laughs> um, we'd really like you to join the cast. Um, so what do I do with this big base where does it stay safely because this is kind of it's hard to to electric base so i don't play electric we'll rent you one and an amp will you learn it yep i'll do it <laughs> <clears throat> so i get this electric base home and i'm learning you know and i say okay it's third finger because i've played guitar in the past and it's third finger the frets were driving me absolutely bonkers how many frets jeez so I finally learn to get through the entire score. I go out there, they hook me up to the amp, and I'm hitting ball, 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 you know, the root fifth, root fifth. Oh, this is boring. They're going to hate me. One of the guys who played guitar says, hey, Steph, let me show you some licks. Okay. I couldn't play a blues thing. He played the blues thing. I said, oh, okay, ball, but this is cool. 
Then he brought a Jimi Hendrix fuzz control attachment <laughs> to the electric. Because there was a song that there was a big bass solo. Da, 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 da. The glissando wouldn't work very well. He put the fuzz on. He showed me how to hit it just in time and then switch back to regular. And I'm standing there rocking out like Jimi Hendrix. This is so <laughs> not me. Miss Richmond Symphony, Miss Classical Bass Player. I had a hoot. I took a short leave of absence from the symphony to do the run of the show. I had so much fun. So I learned how to play electric. I learned how to put together a bass line. I had all the help I wanted in the world. I did pratfalls on stage. I had to put the bass down to do a, a scene. I did pratfalls. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to dig up that old picture. It's grainy as all get out. Overalls, a cowboy hat, and cowboy boots. That's awesome. All, all by saying yes to a couple things. You know, it's like, hey, you want to try this? Sure. Oh, yeah, I don't do this at all. Okay, that's okay. That, that's where some of life's most interesting opportunities come from. You know, I was in Texas uh, this past weekend, and uh, George Amarim, who was hosting me, he said, have you ever experimented with a broke bow? You know, yeah, he's a big bow. Fan. And I thought, I said, no. He's like, here, try this one out from Philip Smith from Tasmania. Try it out. He's like, you know. Philip's selling it. Do you want, you want, you know, I don't know anyone who plays French bow wants one of these. You want it? I'm like, sure, I'll buy it. So I now, right over there, I have a broke bow from Philip Smith. Awesome bow. Never done anything with it in my life. I have no idea what I'm going to do with it. It was just one of those moments. I was just in George's office. I'm like, I'm like, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm perfectly happy doing what I'm doing, but we'll just see. And I think a lot of, you know, by the same token, you got to be careful what you say yes to, because you might, uh, you know, go down some weird path, but, it, but also some of the most interesting opportunities have come just from like some, something that's maybe a little outside of your comfort zone and just say, Saying, sure why not yeah. and that was the i mean that led to a whole lot of fun <laughs> you know i made some money while i was doing it and but at the same time i had a, it was like having a party four nights a week mm -hmm. you know getting into this fun costume and the stage makeup and uh the jokes that were going on during it while we were in the dressing room and and um the theater staff treated us great i mean they were always feeding us on saturday nights um it was right around the holidays, and they threw this huge holiday party for us on the set. And we're stuffing in fry with uh, shrimp cocktails and we're all this great fancy stuff. I mean, so they really treated us well, but it was just so much fun. And I learned a whole other genre. So one of my adult students, who is a jazz player, who plays with a synagogue band, and loves Bach. So I've got this, this triple threat. I had just enough background that I could help him. I said, look, I've got to learn this with you because I don't know how to play jazz. And I've got this whole background now and I'm helping him figure out chords and spice up the jazz lines a bit. And I said, well, like, you know, I did this before, I can do it again. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad I had that experience. So yeah, you say yes to things. Well, I had another say yes to thing experience over the pandemic. I had a, an adult student reach out to me and he said, I've, 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 I've been watching your YouTube videos. I, I want to take lessons with you. I live in San Francisco too. And I'm, I'm just about to write the email saying, sorry, cause I just have a lot of my, I don't really, I teach just enough to not feel like a fraud, but I don't really teach a lot of students. I just have so many other projects, but then I like looked at his name and it's like distinctive name. I looked him up online. He's got this bit. He's a world champion salsa dancer. Who's got this big following and I'm I'm watching these videos and I turn to my wife and I'm like he wants to have lessons I'm like yes I would love to teach you and it has been the most fascinating and interesting um first of all like like to someone who he's a wonderful singer but he's never played an uh, an instrument but he's so into it and he is at such a high level in something else that's artistic and physical. And to watch how he learns and how he learns bass has been so interesting. And then he's drawing parallels to salsa dancing. And I, it's been like it, totally, totally fascinating. Um, and, and it's funny, as I've gotten older, I used to, back in my 20s, I, would, I taught some adult students. And that, like, they were my least favorite 
type of student because the only type of I, we probably talked about this a few years ago, but the only type of student I really understood was the like driven 15 year old who was destined for music school. And I knew how to send them down that path. And I was so confused by somebody who you want to play this for fun. There's no like, uh, you know, music school audition at the end of this. And as I've, you know, matured, hopefully with age, I've I've started to enjoy more and more and actually much more in the last few years working with adult students and it's it's uh, you know it's a massive generalization to try to you know try to generalize all adult learners but like I've, I've gotten more I think I've started to understand maybe it's because I'm older and I'm learning things as an adult too but I'm starting to kind of understand what might be driving people and some of my most passionate students have been adult learners you know and and they might not learn it in the same way or they don't in almost all cases as like one of those 15 year olds but but they can't they I used to kind of, I used to may, may you can probably relate to this I used to think that you never were really going to get better as an adult player it's like ah you're working out but you're never going to get better but I have totally th thrown that belief away as I've watched people and I've watched myself get better at things as I've been older you know so it's it's and it goes back to what I was saying a few minutes ago like the 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 older I get the less sure I am of anything you know and I I've been I've been astounded to watch people who really are committed and are trying to like sincerely get better at things get better at base no matter what age in life so I've, I've had a very long way of saying I've really been enjoying working with adults the last few years they come to you with, well adult they us sure. <laughs> as adults we come to things very differently mm -hmm. I think we have a better appreciation of what's out there mm -hmm. because we've lived a couple of years maybe some of us slightly past 25 you know <laughs> um a little, little past um my adult students are, are wide-eyed when I say, you know, you've reached the point now where I think maybe in the next year we should look for a community orchestra for you. What? I said, yep. Totally within your grasp. Completely. So let's work on some orchestral rep for a year, some simple stuff to start. And we'll, you know, we'll build it up. And my longtime student who's been with me uh, came to me and said, I'd like to learn the recipe from Beethoven line. Hallelujah. <laughs> I have wanted to teach that thing for years. And so I've been going over it and over it and listening and looking at the score. So I know exactly how it fits in and what the notes mean. And, and I've read about it and, um, and Orrin O'Brien sent me a lovely treatise on it and she's got it in her notebook and I've been just looking at everything I can. What do these notes mean? Why is the bass coming in here, interrupting a line? And what's the proper articulation? Oh, we'll go back and listen to the singer because we're supposed to be echoing what the singer is doing. Oh, now I know what it is. <clears throat> and I've been dying to, to introduce this. So when my student came to me and said, I want to do what do the rest of from Beethoven 9, I said, Thank you. Absolutely. We will do this. It's, it's on the curriculum. We're going to do it right now. And so we've been working on it. And by George, he's getting it. <laughs> and I'm thrilled. I mean, this is exciting for me. I'm finally teaching Beethoven 9 to somebody. Well, you know, I... We've done little excerpts here and there from other pieces, but to actually say, yeah, we're doing the, the recipe for Beethoven 9. Oh, and yes, we are on the... the the box cello suite number one, we're starting with the gig to work back to the minuet because the gig was a little more approachable. But when I work back to the minuet, I mean, some teaching some of this now is just having me floored mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that my students want this and they can and they're doing it. That book, that that Oren O'Brien's Double Bass Notebook is such a fabulous resource. I'm glad that you brought that up. I actually filmed a video. I, I need to refilm it. I filmed a video going through it. I bought it over the pandemic and, and I love it. And I, 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 I shot a video and didn't do it justice. So I, I didn't put it out. I got to go through again. But I've had... So 
Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, but it, it's, yeah, it's so interesting. The, the, the here, I, and again, I may have mentioned this when we, when we did that last interview, but here in San Francisco, we have this really cool community orchestra program. We have the San Francisco Civic Orchestra, which has five separate orchestras. And the entry orchestra is, I just picked this thing up, um, but we're going to play together. And then the top orchestra is, we're playing, you know, Mahler 5, you know, or, or something like that. And, and it's really cool. And, and so I've had several adult students do different orchestras or a couple come to me that are from, and it, it's such a cool progression, uh, how that's, how that's set up. And it, it gives people, at least in my experience, it gives people something tangible to work for outside of the lessons. Cause I'm one of those people, I, I love teachers who have studio recitals, you know, no matter what age I just have, I have so few students. I haven't done that you know, in a while, but that gives them something and, and, and meeting other people, like-minded people who are working on. And then of course, what you were describing earlier, getting your students together, even a couple at a time to play through stuff, just giving some sort of reason to play, you know, just not by yourself is so, so powerful. Oh yeah. The, the, the notebook is so valuable. The reading list in there for one. And as I get a book, some of the books a little harder to find, but as I've gotten a book, I've read it, I've checked it off. Mm -hmm. And every one, I get to the end and say, oh, my God. Or I have one book, particular Sound and Motion, which is going to be discussed this week, this Saturday, um, on the ISB Center Stage. Remind me about that book. I know that David, title. <laughs> David McGill, oh, a bassoonist. Oh, right. Sure. From He was in the Chicago Symphony. Yeah, mm -hmm. based on the note grouping taught by the oboist Marcel Tabuto. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he's the book is fantastic. And I'm not going to steal anybody's thunder for this Saturday. But I will tell you that it breaks us down for every instrument and voice. Well, my gosh. So I'm using this to teach scales. And it makes the fingering go much more smoothly. There's no, oh, what do I do on here? Where, where, where am I going? Very simple. You start phrasing on the second note of the scale. Oh, you know, little, little things like this. So that book, um, there are a few others in there. Like the, my mind is just blanked out on which, which books. But I've read all these. Then the list of recordings and the suggested recordings. Oh, yeah, well, this person I love, 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 love. Oh, yeah. You can learn so much from the violinist mm -hmm. <clears throat> because we're all we're doing the same thing. We're drawing horsehair across steel. Exactly. You know, um, how to work in a section. Rules for etiquette that alone can get you can have you keep a job or lose a job. Yes. Yes, indeed. <laughs> and then the, the treatise on the Ginastera variations the double bass solo that in itself or in premiere did the American premiere with Stokowski and the American symphony. So she played that solo. I didn't realize that. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Oren, when you're listening to this thing, don't shoot me, but I'm giving credit where credit is due. Thank you very kindly. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that that's always been a special uh, solo. I, I went through it. When I was getting back to bass playing, and of course I had a notebook, and I said, I studied this when I was 19. The Baltimore Symphony was doing it, and my teacher brought used to bring home Baltimore Symphony music and made me side read this stuff. And I looked, and I said, what is this? I had no idea. It made no sense to me. I didn't have the musical training yet, but he made me play it. How do I get an E on this thing? Where, I, where am I going to get that from? He said, my girl, you will get it. It's on the base. You will find it. Okay. Um, so, you know, it's just, I guess it's also with, go back to the teaching with the adults, you take your life experiences that you've had and you share them with your students, mm -hmm. be it as an anecdote, you know, some kind of story, an experience, or guess what? I've played this. Let me help you with it. Mm -hmm. Or, oh, you want to play that? Let me, let me give you this, the, the, the lowdown, the secret. This is what you want to know. So it's the, the teaching is also the, the, the knowledge, you know, the textbook knowledge. But it's take your experiences, share them with another adult, because adults 
relate by experiences. Oh yeah, and that's so valuable. Like as people join my email list, a, a, an auto email saying "Tell me a little bit about yourself" goes out, and I, the responses I get back are so fascinating. And I've met many, many times, at least weekly, gotten a response. I just pick, I pick up the base, and let me tell you about my teacher. You know, he's in. Yeah, it was, there was one recently from Australia, and he, and he was just talking about how oh he's done all these different things, and we talk about that. You know what these what this piece was like when it was play. You know, and just those life experiences experiences um students really appreciate that uh that's part that's what part of what brings that you know the the, the music to life for them i think oh absolutely um you're talking about teachers um i've had several really good teachers teachers with whom i became close um teachers who mentored me who i mean even taught me how to walk onto a stage which is something that a lot of us don't know. We don't, you're not taught that in conservatory. You know, do you slump out with your bass or do you stand straight and tall and walk out as if you belong there? There's a, you know, totally difference. Well, um, there was Steve Brewster, who was principal of the Washington National Symphony. And he got into my head instead of telling, and instead of this, you know, finger, 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 it's what are you thinking? What are you feeling? You know, the instrument is special. The instrument knows what it wants. Let it tell you. Mm -hmm. Okay, that was powerful. And I, and he heard a change from one week to the following week. The slow movement of the Dittersdorf Concerto when I went to play it for him. Is this the same young lady who was here last week? Where, where did she go? Okay. Um, another one. We've been friends for, I'm not going to say how many years, is Peter Baylor, who was principal in Richmond when I was there. And when I got into this section, I heard this powerful, clean, crisp, beautiful sound. It was from Peter. <laughs> no nonsense. That's what I want. I want to play like that. Peter, would you teach me? Of course. So we'd have lessons after concerts sometimes it would go two o'clock in the morning <laughs> and he taught me that sound where'd you get that sound i started with um oscar zimmerman and then ted mayer and then roger scott oh and then when i think of the <clears throat> you know with my teachers where they've come from and steve brewster was also a roger scott product so when i think of where i've where the, my teachers have been who they've been around, who taught them, what do I have to pass on to my students mm -hmm. but heritage? Isn't that an interesting thing to think about? A, 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 a great, wonderful bassist in the Lyric Opera for Chicago, Greg Sarche, has come up with this bass family tree. And and Greg, Greg and Oren know each other. Greg studied with um, oh Mike uh, Michael. I forget his. It, he was the principal bass of the Met for years and years. Um, Michael Morgan, I think. Michael Morgan. Yeah, yeah. And um, so, so, but that guy, so over the weekend, I was rehearsing this commission that we did a 9 11 memorial tribute, sorry, a fairly heavy piece, but a bass duet. And I was working with George Amarim, who, uh, who he and I were premiering it. And George said, he's like, you know, your sound as a French bow player is really interesting. It doesn't really sound like other French bow players. And he's like, where did you get that from? And so I started thinking, like, I have absolutely no idea. It's just what I do. And so I was thinking, like, so my, my primary teacher was Michael Hovnanian, who was in the Chicago Symphony. Well, well, who did he study with? Okay, so we go back. He studied with James Harnett who, in the Seattle Symphony. Well, who did James? And so you start to, like, it's interesting just that heritage where these schools. And then James so was really into pedagogy. He wrote this eccentric book. And then I'm trying to remember. I need to dig out that family tree. and But it, but it definitely, I'm like three steps removed from one of those famous bass teachers. And I think so many of us are. Yeah, we look at it's in Oren's notebook. Oh, that's right. It is in there. I forgot. Okay. Okay. There we go. Another reason to redo that video. And, <laughs> and I, I go through that family tree. Now, Oren has been cyber mentoring me for maybe 15 years now. Mm -hmm. It's been a long time. And the, the things that her emails have said, boy, that really, that just brings everything together and drives it home. Mm -hmm. And so I say, okay, well, now let's, let me trace back. Okay, so we're about the, a student that Oren has taught us about the fourth 
great grandchild of Samandal. Mm -hmm. You know, we're in this family lineage here. And you can find, like you said, you can find all the greats on that list. Yeah. And so I tell my students, now, I didn't study with Fred Zimmerman, and I haven't gone to Oren for lessons. But what I'm giving you has come down this long, long family tree. Welcome to the group. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the heritage, whether you're an adult student who would probably appreciate it more, mm -hmm. or you know, you're a teenager who wants to go into conservatory, it's getting back to knowing your roots. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, who, who did this person study with? Well, who did he study with? Or where did he come from? Oh my God, there's a connection to Mahler? <laughs> you go back to Manoli? <laughs> There's a connection with Mal. Oh, jeez. And part of the, so, be the beautiful thing about the base community is how how open we all are. Like you're describing these wonderful ISB center stage events, which folks check them out. I'll, I'll you know if you haven't, they're fantastic. Oran O'Brien, what a fan! What a fan! I just love her to death. What a f absolutely phenomenal person and so giving. And I remember talking to her for the podcast maybe in 2017, and my mom got 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 in touch and was listening, and she said, you know, because Oran has this just youthful energy and youth voice and everything and so my mom got really confused because she's listening to this podcast and all of a sudden Orrin's describing all these things from the you know the early 50s and the and, and she said like you know she she got she got like just the the you know but it's just so cool like if we just think of Orrin you know premiering that the variaciones with Stokowski you know every like like and obviously the connection to Bernstein and all these people we're still we still have these these people with us that 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 are contributing so much or or Gary Carr is another example, and and you know, uh, and somebody who's in these center stage events, you know, and and contribute. But like, get, you look at Gary Carr and his connection to all these people. We're we're just we're still connected to some of these musical figures that are just the titans of the twentieth century. Oh, absolutely. Now, Gary Carr, I met him back. I'm going to date myself. No, I don't care. <laughs> I met him back in 1969. Wow. He was a soloist with the Baltimore Symphony, and I grew up in Baltimore. I went to the concert and my teacher at the time, Rocco Litoff, was in the symphony and he and Gary were talking and they were discussing the slow bow right, bowing and bowing towards the bridge. So I got to meet Gary. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, come on, I'm 19 years old. To me, the Baltimore Symphony was the rock star group. And I, I total fangirl here total fangirl and we're talking and I'm thinking god this guy is so important to me he's you know and we corresponded off and on over several years he sent me one of his records he sent me I mean this what a sweet gentleman mm -hmm. he took a real interest ran into him again in the early 80s at the National Symphony he was doing Oh God, what was it? It was a Bottasini piece or Bottasini. I keep forgetting my good Italian. And Steve Brewster had reorchestrated it for him. So I went to hear that. I go backstage with Steve. There's Gary. Oh my gosh, how have you been? So the, you're right about the bass community. It's just, we're open and we're sharing. And the big thing is we help each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That comes out on the different podcasts. That comes up with the ISB. We're always willing to help somebody else out. You know, I'm in the Contrabass Conversations community on Facebook and all about the Contrabass or whatever, and looking for this kind of bow, or what do you do in this case, or how do you take care of this kind of rosin? And the answers are coming in, and not the smart aleck mm -hmm. Facebook answers, but really good information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just a lot of caring, or I don't know, but try this, or call this person. I mean, and I know we're off topic here, but it, it still, I think, goes back to teaching adults, is that we've got this group of people that a lot of teachers just don't want to touch because of time. Or they've, the teachers have reached the pinnacle of, well, look, I'm only going to teach conservatory students because I don't need to teach anybody else. This is my interest, and I'm going to concentrate in this area. I wouldn't be very good with adults because I have to change my requirements, and I don't know if I'm that flexible. So it's not a case, again, it's not a case of, you're not good enough for me. It's simply, it's the wrong fit. Mm -hmm. So I, I defend my, my symphony colleagues 
and as I say, my betters, who aren't willing to teach the younger, the, the adult students because their focus is different and it would be a disservice. And I get it. So you get this, this group of bass players and we're all willing to reach out and help. And that's why I'm so passionate about teaching adults because these are bass players. They want to learn. They want to be part of our club. They want to be part of the family. They have fallen in love with the instrument. Mm -hmm. And you know, would I like to teach a bright young star? Who wouldn't? But at the same token, I would not give up my adults for anything. Yeah, me neither now. You know, it's funny because like like if you talk to Jason, uh, I don't know, 20, 20 some years ago, I the I would have, it wouldn't have been because I didn't want, it would have been because I felt like I didn't have the, the skill set to work with. The, and, and and it's kind of like what you're describing with with maybe people who are used to teaching people going on to professional careers. It's, it, it, it is a bit of a different skill set, I think, or, or or a different mindset, maybe, you know, and, and yeah, but, but boy, the community, you know, I'm thinking you remind me of my first time encountering Gary Carr, I was probably 1990. And I was in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And for me, it wasn't the Baltimore Symphony, the South Dakota Symphony, they were the bomb. Whoa, the South Dakota Symphony, you know, and, and, and Gary, I'd seen Gary play, you know, he got up, he played Dragon Eddie, he played Moses Fantasy, he did his thing, he played duets with the principal and I mean I thought I want to do that and how many people he's influenced or another moment and and people like get how many thousands of people has Gary influenced like that another great person to, in the base uh, community Rufus Reed I remember I was ni 19 years old maybe at Northwestern and he came and he was the guest artist for our jazz festival and I remember Ru Rufus he, he came up to me and he we were talking and he just was so personable and it's somebody that that I, you know, I guess you could think, you know, he, he wouldn't have to be, he, he, he's a big name, but he was, and he gave, gave me an album of him playing bass duets and was just, it was just like, he made me feel so welcome and so much like a, like, uh, not a peer exactly, but kind of like a peer, like, like part of the, and, and I just remember thinking that moment with Rufus in, but also with Gary back when I was, I don't even know how old, young, you know, watching Gary play with my teacher, you know, I went backstage and watch him rehearse those duets and just thinking like what you know it, it's just it's so cool and our community is so those people are and especially the um at uh, isb is a great example you know those people at events like that are so accessible you know you can enter if you want to interact with these people who are likely your role models or people that you look up to or have listened to the, you will be able to you know if you if you're in the right circle and those circles will welcome you Oh, yeah. Another example of this, um, I have always looked up to Douglas Knapp. Mm -hmm. He was past president of ISB, and he lives over the, across the bridge in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. um, we had corresponded, well, how did we start, I think, Facebook friending or something. Mm -hmm. And I started sending folks to him to get music. I mean, that's just, you know, you support your local bass player. And I and so, boy, I've always wanted to work with Douglas. God, I wanted to want to work with him. Well, I was in a community orchestra at the time, and the bass section would, I was principal, and sometimes we'd have maybe three players, and sometimes we'd have five, and sometimes four, and sometimes two. And it was a rather large concert. I forgot what the piece was, it was rather big, and I wanted a beefy section. So I went to the conductor and I said, um, uh, well, um, you know, you've brought in a couple of my college chums in the past, but I've got like prime 1A bass player for you. What do you think? So he told me how much they would pay. And I said, well, that's going to get you only the dress rehearsal and concert, maybe. So I sent Douglas an email. He said, you happen to have caught me the one free time I have. <laughs> and he came over and joined the bass section. And Joanne De Maria Bates, who had studied with Roger Scott, who was the first woman to have ever subbed with the filio in the bass section, she was also in the bass section because she happened to be in that community. 
And she, I didn't know she was going to play with us that night. And so playing with Joanne and Douglas was like getting a free bass lesson. Douglas came in and the bass players all went to talk to him and he was warm and gracious. And where do you want me to sit? Oh, she should sit first. Whatever. Where do you want me to I'll sit anywhere you want. So I paired him up with another lady who I thought would really benefit from working with Douglas. And then we had a split section for two smaller pieces. And one was the Hummel trumpet concerto. Mm -hmm. And I said, Douglas, why don't you take that? You sure? I said, absolutely. Because I got to sit there and get a bass lesson. <laughs> okay. I had a total bass lesson. I mean, I just geeked out the whole time. So, you know, he's another one of these generous, kind, helpful people. He's one heck of a, a bass player. No matter if it's jazz or classical, Douglas gets the job done. He's the best. Yeah, I'm a huge, oh, yeah. I'm a huge fan. Wonderful person. And yeah, just a great example of somebody who is, um, yeah, really, really able to do everything. I mean, he's he's a. Uh, 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 the full-time faculty at Rowan, you know, in jazz, absolutely fabulous classical player plays with all these, all these different ensembles. And yeah, just wonderful, wonderful person D done great things for the ISB with his involvement there. And, and, and then the publishing over the years and yeah. And how cool to, to come in and, and make an impression and, and, you know, inspire people, you know, like that. And the, the, person I paired him with is an adult student. Mm. She's going to one of the community music schools. And I said, what a great match. I would have loved to have played had him on staying with me. Oh my gosh. I, I mean, that would have been, but I said, no, no, no. He, he belongs with her. Cause I had an, a, a younger player with me and I thought I'll keep my orchestra daughter with me. Cause she'll be happier and put and just paired this other person with Douglas and it was just match made in heaven how we had everything everybody had a, a really good it was a good balance with stand partners mm -hmm. but again it, it's an adult student you know let's give her a break she's not my student but let me do something nice for her because she really puts out a lot of effort in the bass section and she also plays in my summer orchestra wow yeah so let's let's do something you know, I wanted to sit with Douglas. Oh my God. I said, no, no, I don't have to sit with him. He's in the section. <laughs> so anyway, but that's, so, so we're putting this whole thing together with God, we've gone off into every tangent possible, but it's, it seems like when you're teaching an adult student, you're just being a bass player because what do we do? We help somebody else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's really simple. Not everybody can teach an adult student or wants to, but those of us who are teaching adults, I think, are really reaping a lot of rewards. Yeah. Hear, hear. Uh, you know, I love that that podcast we did a few years ago, uh, get that, that, you know, it's so cool that, 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 that people got in touch with you through that. And like, cause you know, this is a very, it's not a solitary thing doing this because we're talking right here, but, but I, I, I have, I sort of, you know, we get done and then this goes on Dropbox and I sort of go on, you know, and then I run to Trader Joe's or whatever. And I sort of forget that it, it goes out in the world like that. And so it's so cool to know that it has, it can have this ripple effect. I think that's one of the, we're talking about technology and the benefits of you know and 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 youtube and and these isb center stages and that's just that's one of the positives of having this kind of technology that we do and i when i hear back from folks from all over the world i've, I've told the story too many times but but um i one of my favorite set of emails i got was somebody who said i listened to your pie he said greetings from the jungles of indonesia i li i i i listen i he's like a military contractor or in the military something i forget what but i listen i'm a bass player but i'm on assignment and so i'm listening to but i've been listening to you for a long time i used to be based in kazakhstan and listening so i just just the thought of somebody with their iphone or whatever you're downloading the podcast and listening and here i am just sitting in my condo in san francisco and I, and it's just so cool how this technology uh can can connect people like that and go out and it's something that especially with doing the podcast i totally forget i mean i'm just i we're just hanging out and i'd want to talk to you anyway even 
even if that little record button wasn't going. So it's it's like, you know, this is like good for me because I'm all, you know, I'm, I'm excited to go teach my next adult student now because we've been talking and now I've been taking, I've got to read Sound in Motion, which I haven't read. So, you know, um, it's like a good personal development thing for me to do this. It's so cool that it goes out in the wider world like that. And you'd think I would realize that having done 800 plus, but I still sort of forget about it. You know why you forget about it? Because no. you're doing it. No, because <laughs> you're doing it with the, for the right reason. Oh, yeah. Uh, hopefully. Yeah, that makes I, I, I buy that for sure. <laughs> you know, it's something that you love doing and you're giving. You know, you're connecting. You're, you're, you're still part of this space community and you're bringing people together. And you may be answering questions that people don't know they have. Uh, you're bringing up topics that people never thought of. The vibrations with with Jeff. Oh, what was it? Jeff Zimmerman. Yeah, right. Exactly. That I mean, brought. That's why I wrote to you about the music therapy thing. This would be such an, an amazing fit for him. Well, I emailed him right after you did. I mean, that and that's what I love about the podcast when like when like people who listen to it like get inspired by each other. You know, that's like the really cool thing. So that's that that was I loved your email and and that he was thrilled. So I so Oh, I'm glad. Yeah. Listen, if you want to tell him to email me. Okay, I will. Cuz cuz I'll share a story with you. Um I was back at uh, taking I was in school and we had those Wednesday morning performance hours. You had to go. No matter what they were showing, you had to go. And this one morning, there was a group of people from the music therapy school at a now defunct hospital. And they were recruiting music therapy students. Go get your bachelor's, come to us, get your master's in music therapy. And they were showing films. And, and one guy told a story. There was a gentleman named Charlie. And he had very serious dementia. This is before we knew Alzheimer's existed. Now you know how old I am. Um, if you didn't before, you know now. <laughs> anyway, Charlie was non-communicative. But they realized that Charlie was probably a young person in around the 40s and the big band era. So the music therapist came in one day with some records, big band music, and Charlie started talking. First he was talking big band, and then he came into the present. He knew his name. He recognized him as a therapist, and he stayed very lucid and present for about two hours. So when the cardiologist, when he had a cardiology appointment, because he had some heart issues, they said, okay, time to tune up Charlie for his appointment. Because he couldn't answer questions. Are you having pain? Are you having trouble breathing? He couldn't do that until he had his music therapy session. And they knew he was good for two hours. So they'd get him in there, make sure that they had him tuned up for about an hour or so before the appointment so he'd last through the entire appointment. Wow. And then slowly he would regress back to... So there, the, there is... So what Jeff was talking about is that absolutely this is completely 100% true. Mm -hmm. You know, we tune the body. And their vibrations, and I'm thinking, okay, balance the chakras, you're not sitting straight, you know, the whole bit. And you're not breathing deeply enough. And there, go back to the, the vibrations. What I learned from Ira Gold's in-person workshop, there were 15 bass players in that room. I was auditing, thank goodness, because I had to take notes. I couldn't have remembered everything. And he started them off on open Ds. This was at Potter Violins, who opened up the, uh, this performance space for us. And I'm sitting in the center of the room and listening, and I hear 15 open Ds. And boy, was, was I buzzing. And then all of a sudden, the vibration got very smooth. Within five minutes, he had a bass section. And they started with Beethoven 9, the Ode to Joy. And then he broke the group into two. Some play this melody, some play that. And, okay, now take it up an octave. There was a bass section. Five minutes is all it took. And then I had 15 new friends. I was hanging out with the guys from Ithaca. You know, hey, you want to try my bass? Yeah, sure. You want to try my bass? Yeah. To... I mean, it was an amazing experience. So I always start my lessons Let's do some open Ds. 
and immediately, if, whether it's an adult or a teenager, it, it works with everybody. It kind of brings that person where he needs to be. Mm -hmm. And it's, and the breathing slows and I can just see or hear in this one student's case, the whole, the whole relaxation thing set in. So we do the open D's and then we do those glissandos up an octave, down an octave. And Steve Brewster's quote, a good bass player knows how to make the instrument move. Well, you get to the A string and do a glissando and you can hear a definite move. Oh, yeah. So I always tease with the students. You do it on the E string. So I tease my students, well, there's the calf. There's a slightly older calf. Well, that's mama cow. Boy, that bull is not happy. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how we know that. That's how my students know. Even with my adults, I do this. That's how my students know I did it right. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Look for the move. It just it diffuses the tension of the week. Make that bass move. That's that's a that's a great that's a great way that's a that's a great quote by the way and that and that's a and that's a great way to start. I'm going to be thinking about that open. I mean, I, now that you're now that you're telling me about it, I think I think that's the way I usually start playing myself. I don't know that's the way I always start my students though. I need to start doing that because it for so many reasons. But that's such a great neutral ground in terms of the bass. Not over on the G string. You're not trying to get the low strings going. You can really think think um think through and then and then to get those glissandi going like that that's a that's a beautiful way to get people going well the glissandi i picked up from oh that was the uh, teacher's workshop that ira did and i think that was tracy rowell's one of tracy's things mm, mm -hmm. the open d was from ira's workshop i'd gone to and then also this teacher's workshop carol and emery talking about the open d well, there's got to be something to it if i throw all these people going with you know, when I've been doing that and my students love it. So, I mean, this is, um, oh, and by the way, the, 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 the mooing mm -hmm. was from the late Steve Brewster of the Washington National Symphony. He's the one who told me that a, a good bass player can make the, make the bass moo. <laughs> It's great how we we pick up all these techniques from people you know where we're always standing on the shoulders of giants but there's you know if if, exactly. if caroline emery is talking about it and if you're picking up from ira gold and these all these other places it's probably a probably a technique worth investigating right absolutely absolutely <laughs> you get that and you get fred zimmerman's bowing book and Orrin o'brien's notebook you've got the whole package Stephanie, thank you so much for chatting again. Folks, if you want to reach out to Stephanie for lessons or just to say hi, a lot of people did after the last episode. Her email is linked up to in the show notes, and you can find that if, probably in whatever you're listening to or ContrabassConversations.com, our website for all things podcasting. It has been... I guess it's fall now. It's been a whirlwind of a few months after sitting at home for, as we were talking about in this, especially in the intro here, for a very long time, like is likely for you, uh, to get back out and doing things is a lot of fun. I am recording these as I do, sitting down and doing the intros and outros four in a row. This is two of four. And... Uh, going to Houston to work with some teachers in the Houston public schools with Joey Nager, the great Joey Nager. I'm such a fan of what he does. Great bass luthier based in the Houston area. And I was just actually reading the most recent Bass World magazine, uh, which uh, comes out three times a year. If you're not a member of the International Society of Bassists, you can join up and get that. And the cover art is Joey's Home Depot base, which there's a very cool story behind that. And actually, Joey's been on the podcast recently. Now that I think about it, we were talking about the, what the heck were we talking about? Were we talking about the Luthier, uh, the build base? That's what we were talking about earlier this summer or spring even. Boy, does time fly. So thank you for listening. Thank you for sticking through. If you're all the way to these end <laughs> remarks, you're a true fan or you're tied up to a chair and you can't get to your device, as I like to say. Um, but I really appreciate it. And I know that Stephanie appreciates it and all the guests appreciate it. And it's a funny thing doing this podcast for so many years, but it's been a lot of fun and I get a lot out of it. I always get off and I think, all right, that was time well spent. I don't always think that with all the projects in my life, but I think that more and more projects are falling into that category. I hope. <laughs> Before I get too philosophical, I will close this out and thank the team who put these together with me. Michael Cooper, Steve Hinchy, 
Trevor Jones and Mitch Mooring. Mitch makes beautiful bases in Kilgore, Texas. That's a couple hours east of Dallas, Fort Worth. He won an award at the 2019 International Society Bases Convention and beautiful, beautiful instruments. Learn more at MitchMooring.com. We've got all kinds of cool projects going on with our interns here in the fall of 2021. More to share on that soon. I'm your host, Jason Heath, and we'll see you again soon for more life at the low end of the spectrum. Thank you.